Hey, good morning, Pete, North Las Vegas. Doing a video today on my 1971 Camaro and uh, some of the issues I've had installing the retro sound uh, radio. And not gonna get into every last little detail on how to wire these up, although we will cover some of that. But here's what I'm using. I decided to go with their 2B motor Here's some of the features it has. Um, I decided to go ahead and just use their subwoofer. I'm not trying to put together the mega sound system from hell. I just want something that's gonna work. Um, that's gonna be under the dash. And those are gonna be the two rear speakers. Now I may end up going with two more speakers and maybe put them in the kick panels or somewhere under the dash. And uh, we'll figure that out after I fire this radio up and see how it sounds, whether I need any more speakers. But my feeling is this, this should all work. But primarily, I wanted to discuss in this video, like I was saying, the issues that I've had during install and things to watch out for when you, uh, when you order from these catalog companies. And even Retrosound has some, some things that aren't quite right with their documentation. Okay, so the first place I went to pick out the radio from Retrosound was Classic Industries and their Camaro catalog. And um, we'll turn to the radio page and I'll show you what they offer. Okay, so before we get into the catalog issue, let me back up here a little bit. Uh, when you order the the radio from Retrosound, um, they call them motors, which is short for Motorola. And Motorola was basically uh, Vict Victorola from back in the 1930s when, when Motorola was first founded and they got into doing uh, car radios. So I let Retrosound just shortened it up to motor. So if you're wondering why they call the actual radio a motor, I believe that's the reason why. Anyway, they come in uh, Series 1, Series 2, 3, and 4, and they have two different versions of each series. I got the 2B, and like I was saying at the beginning of the video, it, it has the options and features that I was looking for. And some of the the more expensive units uh, had features that I, I just didn't care about. Um, the electronic specs, the power output, all that stuff is basically the same between the different versions. Um, so it's just the features that you want. All right, so you get your basic radio that comes in the box. Then what you get is a radio face. That's the part that has your buttons and... This radio face attaches to the radio with four screws on the back. Now, depending on which model you get, this radio face may have the basil already included and it's, it's almost like a one piece unit and it just slides in the opening. Now on my particular Camaro 71, this is actually two pieces. So your radio face, this part here is just your buttons and then you have to have a separate basil that snaps over the radio face to fit in the opening of your dash. I hope I'm making sense here. So what I did was I went to the Classic Industries catalog and I'm looking all over the place and everything says, you know, uh, 69 through 77, whether it's the Laguna model, the Long Beach model, the Hermosa model, and this Daytona model is what I decided to go with. I don't remember why. It just seemed to have the uh, the look that I was going after. Turns out that this right here, this basil and the radio face with the knobs uh, shows up as one piece. And this does not fit a 71 Camaro stock opening. Um, it was about a quarter to three eighths too narrow and I had a big gap here on the side and then the other thing about the Daytona model was it was the basil came all the way up into here so even if I was willing to hack up my 40 plus year old uh, dash here which I wasn't it still wasn't going to fit because it was going to get into this external fascia here in order to get the basil to fit so it's like here's our first issue classic industry says oh this fits a 1971 no, the Daytona model does not. So then I thought, well, let's go 
over to the retro and see what they say. And you can see here, vehicle search, 1971 Chevy Camaro. And it shows two versions. So let's go down and look. Well, there's that Daytona model again. And here's the retrograde. And like I said, based on their website and vehicle search, this Daytona is supposed to fit my car. It does not. What I discovered was the retro style here is the one that fits. And it takes a radio face and a snap-in basil. And I probably should have done a video during installation, so this would make better sense. But this basil opening here actually fits the dash. This Daytona model does not. So, luckily for me, this company is based here in a town called Henderson, which is on the south end of Las Vegas. And it's mostly a warehouse. They're not really set up to do any kind of retail or, or wholesale business. But I called them up and I said, hey, I ordered the wrong radio because Classic Industries wasn't clear on what I needed. And I said, your very own website is a little screwed up as far as what fits my dash without having to make any modifications. And the guy said, oh, yeah, what you need is the retro radio face, not the Daytona. And it comes with a separate basil. The basil part number is 117 for chrome or 217 for all black. And I went with the 217 model, all black. So anyway, I called them up and I talked to their technician who works there. And I said, look, I don't want to get into all the shipping and returns and all this other crap. And then possibly find out that, you know, I still got a fitment problem. Can I come in and just swap out some of this Daytona stuff for the correct retro radio? And he said, yeah, he would do that. So I went down there and I actually took my entire dash with me. I took the radio, even though I didn't really need to take the radio because the radio itself is, it fits anything. It's, it's just the radio face and the basil that dictate what's going to fit in your dash. So anyway, I took all the stuff in and uh, they just swapped everything out for me right on the spot. And I thought that was kind of cool, even though it wasn't cool that we had this problem to start with. Great customer service. They made things right. I was lucky because they're here in Las Vegas. Okay, so we got the radio straightened out. We got the radio installed. Everything fits nice. Matter of fact, it fit really nice. I had to take a file and knock off about, I would say, ten thousandths on the upper and lower dimension to get this basil to snap in. It was such a tight fit, but I'd rather have it a little bit too tight than, than loose. Okay, so we'll get into the how I installed it, and we'll talk about some of the wiring on, on the back of the radio. And like I said at the beginning of the video, it's not going to be a detailed wiring tutor tutorial. I'm basically just doing this video. If you have a, a second-gen Camaro, what to watch out for if you're going to go with RetroSound. Okay, so hopefully I didn't get anybody too confused on the, the first part of the video here, so I'm going to try to simplify it a little bit. This is what I originally ordered, the Daytona model. And that came with the black push buttons and knobs. It did not fit. What I needed was a retrograde B-face with the motor too. So just get rid of that Daytona part. Order a Motor 2 or whatever motor you decide to order. And for a 71 Camaro, you're going to need the retrograde B1 face. And you're going to need a, a basil. Now, 217 is black. 117 is chrome. So here's the actual part number for the, um, the retro radio B, which is black. See the part numbers down there. Made in Malaysia, which is better than China, in my opinion. So this is the radio face that you'll need to fit a 71 Camaro. In addition to the basil. The basil is not included with the radio face. You have to order that separately. So you're going to need this radio face, the 217 or the 117 basil. And then, like I said, I went with this, um, this number 2B motor. Okay, so that's what will allow you to get the radio actually in your dash. Okay, so just quickly back to the Classic Industries catalog. 
Um, they don't offer the Retro Radio B1 face, which is what you'll need to put this in a 71 Camaro. And like I was saying earlier in the video, they offer all these different Lagunas and Long Beach and whatevers. Uh, they don't offer what you actually need to put this in your stock OEM dash in a 71 Camaro. They list pretty much everything else that Retro uh, Sound offers but that, which seems kind of odd to me because I think that second gen, first and second gen Camaros is probably going to be your most popular uh, cars for these radios. And, and why they don't list what you actually need, I, I have no idea. So anyway, Classic Industries needs to do a little better job on their, their catalog. All right, so let's talk about the back of the radio. Dedicated subwoofer outputs for the subwoofer that I'm going to use from Retrosound. These are pre-amplified front and rear, left and right outputs. Um, if you're going to use these because these are pre-amplified, these are not amplified, you're going to need a separate amplifier to run speakers. Or whatever you decide to use these outputs for, you're going to need something to amplify the signal. So you can't just plug these directly into your speakers. Fine. Comes with a USB that's hardwired in. And this also will act as a charger. It's not just signal or it's not just charger. It does both. It's a complete USB port. Um, this is your radio antenna. And down here is your microphone for Bluetooth. So when you're talking to your phone, your whatever, microphone. Now, you have two separate connectors that, that plug into the main connector here. So when you get this from, from Retrosound, this first part of the harness here plugs into the back of the radio or what they call motor. And then it breaks down into two sections on the, on the other side here. These are all your speaker connections. And um, some of the instructions aren't real clear as to what's what. So here's the tag that comes on the speaker wires to show you what color does what. And here is the other end of the harness. And yellow is your constant 12 volts. Now this radio is supposed to be non-volatile as far as your settings. So I believe the constant 12 volts is for your, your clock or something else that, that doesn't have a non-volatile memory. So you're gonna need constant 12 volts. The blue wire is for a power antenna, which I don't care about. And then there's another blue wire with a white stripe. And that is your subwoofer down here at the bottom. Amp turn on for your subwoofer. And we'll get into that here in just a minute. So I won't be using a power antenna. Your red is gonna be your switched ignition source. So you're going to provide 12 volt battery power from a switched source, a yellow constant 12 power antenna. We're not using ground and the amp turn on. All right. I know I'm kind of repeating myself here, so we'll get off of that. Okay. So this part here is actually part of the, the molded in dash where the radio mounts and you can see the distance here. And GM did not do things symmetrically back then. You can see there's a much shorter distance here. This right here is one of the spacers that comes with the kit. And I ended up using both the spacers just to spread the load across the plastic when I tightened up the, uh, the volume and the tuning potentiometers. But anyway, it took me about five tries to get everything lined up the way I wanted, get everything at the proper depth, and get my snap-in basil, which is right here, into the location that I wanted in the dash. Now, I've seen some other videos where sometimes the inputs are reversed. This side could be volume, and this side could be tuning. So you have two options. You can either swap your knobs around if you have the symbol-type knobs. If you have the, uh, the fancier chrome knobs that do not have the symbols on them, then you're just going to have to remember which is which when you go to use your radio. But I went with the OEM knobs, 
So tuning and volume. Now, like I said, those get plugged into the back of your motor or radio. So you have two options to get that where you want it. You can swap the wiring around. You can take this tuning wire. They just plug in with like a phone jack. And you can just swap the wiring around to get the orientation that you want. Or like I was saying, you just swap your knobs around, wherever you want to do. Um, some dashes come, the reason that's a pro that could be a problem is some dashes come marked, uh, embossed or labeled, uh, like old trucks, one will say selector and the other will say volume. So in that case, you know, your knobs have to be in the correct orientation. And in that case, all you're going to do is swap the wiring in the back. Okay, so they give you a piece of strapping in the kit to support the back of the radio. The radio is very lightweight compared to the original. Man, that original radio must weigh like at least 10 pounds. I mean, it is heavy. And this radio compared to the original equipment is very, very light. Um, I kind of went through the different options on how I was going to support the back of the radio. And the instructions say, you know, to take it, and they don't really tell you how to do it, but I decided that it was best to support the radio with the dash itself because of vibration and, and movement between the dash and like the firewall or the, the, the main part of the dash of the car. If I were to take this strap and reinforce it there, um, that means the dash is going to be bouncing around and the firewall isn't. And that's actually going to put stress and strain on the radio and, and the mounts. So I decided it would be better to put the reinforcement bracket as part of the dash where the radio is actually connected to the dash here. That way there's not going to be any movement from vibration or shock. And um, so that's why I decided to mount it this way. Now on the, the, the Camaro dash, there was a, a hole already here. I did not have to drill this. And this opening here, there's a center console that my car came with and the courtesy lights for the uh, center console, the safety neutral switch on the uh, automatic shifter and all that wiring came through this opening here into the console. So I believe this hole, I don't remember, it's been so long, but I think that hole was for a wiring clip uh, to kind of maintain the wires going into the console. So that hole was already there. So I just used a nice flush button head and this clears the, uh, the mounting, the metal mounting bracket that this goes on to in the car. And I'll take this out in a minute and show you how all this goes. But anyway, this seems here to be the best way to support the, the back of the radio. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the subwoofer and another kind of an issue I ran into that I'm not quite sure about. And then we'll discuss some things that were not in the literature that I had to figure out by sending RetroSound some emails. But I guess first thing is, uh, let's, let's talk about the profile of this thing. Um, it is pretty low profile. Sorry about the camera work. But it comes in at uh, about two and three quarters as far as the height. So this might fit under, uh, might fit under a lot of front seats, back seats, I don't know, wherever you want to put it. All right, let's talk about subwoofer itself. Okay, so at the beginning of the video, we talked about how RetroSound has dedicated subwoofer RCA jacks. So the first thing to hook up your subwoofer is you're going to take your RCA jacks. You're going to plug your RCA cables into there. And you're going to plug the other end into the input RCA jacks. Okay, so we got our dedicated RCA jacks hooked up. Um... What if you don't have dedicated RCA jacks? What if you're using somebody else's radio? Um, RetroSound shows you how to hook it up without the RCA jack. So we'll zoom in on the uh, wiring diagram for that real quick. So you're not dead in the water if you don't have RCA jacks. Okay, so you don't have any RCA jacks. Here's the harness that plugs into the back of the subwoofer, which I probably should have mentioned first. And it has um, speaker wire input connections. Okay, so these are your speaker wire inputs, and uh, they show you how to splice into your existing speakers right here. 
So if you don't have dedicated RCA jacks, that's how you do it. Okay, so towards the beginning of the video, we talked about the blue-white wire down here coming off the radio. And that's this one right here. And that's going to get hooked up to your subwoofer. And that's what turns a subwoofer on when you turn your radio on. Now, the subwoofer also requires 12-volt, what they say, constant power. So coming off the, the back of the harness that plugs in, they recommend that you, you put this to uh, your battery. It has an inline 10-amp fuse. Now, here's the part where it gets a little confusing. I ordered a separate wiring kit to get the RCA cables and some of the extra length on the, uh, the blue signal wire to turn the amp on. And um, what I got in the kit was a 15 amp fuse. Comes with a nice uh, O-ring, water resistant 15 amp fuse for constant power to the subwoofer. So, like I said, it comes with an inline 10 amp fuse, but then in the external wiring kit that you can order separately, they give you a 15 amp fuse. So what is it, RetroSound? Do I need a 15 amp fuse or a 10 amp fuse? Okay, well, I'm probably just gonna leave the 10 amp in there. I may put the 15 amp in, I don't know. They recommend that you run this straight to your battery, but I don't really need to, and I'm getting ready to show you why. Okay, so the reason I'm not worried about running this straight to my battery, in, in your vehicle, you may want to, but in mine, I don't have to because I'm using an American Auto Wire aftermarket wiring harness, which comes with an extra six-way power disconnect. And if you go over here, and you look at what it does for you, it gives you uh, quite a few options. And the wire and the fuse size at the block, it, it's pretty beefy stuff. Um, you know, 15, 20, 30 amps. So I can get plenty of power underneath the dash without having to go all the way to the battery, which is what I've decided to do. So um, I kind of mapped out what I'm gonna use for what. On the subwoofer constant, the big yellow wire, I'm going to run that off one of the pinks that comes off the uh, the wiring harness here. And that's going to give me a switched 20 amps. So that's an ignition switch 20 amps, meaning the only time the subwoofer is going to get power is if the keys and accessory are on. Not sure about accessory, but definitely on. And this is a separate thing I put on my uh, my dash, which we'll talk about in some other video. Now, this this constant 12 volt power that that RetroSound says that you need for the subwoofer. I asked them. I says, is there some kind of settings or or non volatile? Is that why you have to have constant power? And he said, no. And so it doesn't have to be constant power to the subwoofer. Um, he said that can be switched off and on, doesn't matter. And then I said, well, let's just say I did hook it straight up to the battery. And it's just sitting there. Um, there's no signal coming in from the radio telling the subwoofer to turn it on. You're saying it doesn't really require constant power. But is there still some kind of parasitic draw, even though you're saying it's not constant power? And he says, no. He said, uh, there is no parasitic power unless the radio turns it on. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm not going to run this straight to the, the extra wiring. I'm going to put a switch in between just so I can kill 12 volts to the subwoofer for whatever reason. Maybe I'm driving along listening to the radio and uh, smoke starts coming out from the subwoofer from underneath the seat. For some reason, um, you know, I went with a 15 amp fuse when I should have went with the 10 amp inline. And anyway, uh, none of the fuses pop for whatever reason from the fuse block of the car through the separate fuses. You know, it, my, my seat's catching fire. Um, I want some way to turn the subwoofer off. 
So we're gonna get into how I'm gonna handle that. Okay, so in, in order for me to have on-off capability to the subwoofer and not have to rely on whether the radio is on or off to, to kill power uh, to the subwoofer, I'm gonna run this subwoofer power through an aux switch on the dash. So this will allow me to turn the subwoofer off whenever I want to. And like I said, not have to rely on whether the radio is on or off. And I just, I just want that capability. I know a lot of you are probably thinking, ah, you don't need to do that, but I'm going to do it. Okay, so how did I mount the switch panel and where is it going to go? It is going on the left side of the dash that goes under the steering column. There's my vintage air controls. And um, what I did was, uh, let me see if I can get this set up a little better. Um, what I did was I, I deleted the, I deleted the ashtray and here's the ashtray mount that went in that hole and it took up a lot of real estate behind the dash. Um, I don't smoke. I don't smoke anything. Uh, nobody in my family smokes. Um, probably anybody that lights up in my car is going to get a reprimand. So... As far as me owning the car and driving it and passengers, uh, there, there won't be any smoking. So I didn't feel bad about deleting the, the ashtray mounting bracket. And um, this is the original ashtray that went in the bracket. And it's, the faceplate is just held on by these two screws. And then there was a couple of rivets underneath that I drilled out. And I just decided that I wasn't going to modify the OEM one. I'm just going to leave it alone. Well... Classic Industries started selling repop ashtrays, and they're all one-piece plastic. There's no metal tray that, that screws on. So I took a hacksaw and cut the back off, and I had just enough room to get all my switches mounted. And so the uh, repop ashtray cover is going to go right here on the dash. Okay, so now we're back to the subwoofer. I put in an extra switch on this uh, dash panel. So I'm gonna run the uh, subwoofer wiring through this aux switch. And that'll allow me to turn the, uh, the subwoofer off and on manually. Like I said, I, I know I've kind of repeat myself, but not relying on whether the radio's on or off on the trigger wire. Okay, so now we're gonna get into the last problem with this kit. And this is kind of a big obstacle for me, um, is the under dash speaker. Okay, so this is the 4x10 speaker that goes underneath the dash. And uh, it's a triaxle, has two tweeters and a, and a main mid-range. And both left and right channels get hooked up to the speaker. And I'll show you a, a wiring diagram of all the different ways you can wire this up real quick. And then we'll talk about the problem I got. Okay, so here's the different ways you can wire the under dash speaker whether you're using the retro sound or OEM or somebody else's radio, they, they give you quite a few different options to get your, your under dash speaker up and running. But here's the problem. Okay, so we're looking at the dash on my 71 Camaro. And this is where the under dash center speaker goes. You can see the grill here is bowed down. It's not perfectly flat. Now, here's the problem. We'll go back in the house and I'll explain this. Okay, so we were just out looking at the dash on the car, and you, you can see that the grill, the, the slotted part of the dash, is kind of concave. It's not flat. Now, if you look at this speaker, and we come up, you'll see the tweeters. They are at the same height as the mount. So even if even if you had a perfectly flush perfectly straight panel to mount this on, you may still have an interference issue with these tweeters. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go buy some foam. I'm gonna add about a half an inch of foam. And then I'm gonna put some, some leveling screws through these holes here, these mounting holes. I'm gonna put some leveling screws so that the foam can only compress till it hits the top of the leveling screw. 
And then that will prevent these tweeters from hitting the, the dash underneath once I get everything all snugged up. And then the only other issue I have is trying to get this thing mounted because this mounting is completely different than the factory mount. And I got a bunch of hardware on order to try to solve this problem. But uh, let me show you the factory mount here and you'll see why this isn't going to work. Okay, so the original factory speaker um, had kind of a square magnet that would fit up inside here on the back of the speaker. And on the it would fit over the OEM like this. And this... This part here would clip into the front part of the dash, and then this would screw into the back bracket up against the firewall, and that's how the original uh, speaker got held in. I was gonna try to maybe just put a bracket across here and then bolt this old bracket into the, the screw hole they give you, uh, but there's a height difference and there's some other things going on to where trying to modify the original equipment bracket is just not gonna work. And, um, Retro gave me their, a, a bracket that, that came with a kit, and it's not even close to working. So I got a bunch of hardware on order to um, get this mounted under the dash, and that should be here Monday. So anyway, that was kind of the last issue was that, that tweeters, they just stick up too high. And either Retro needs to put in a thicker piece of mounting plastic here to avoid that issue. All right, doing it again, repeating myself. Okay, well, hopefully I didn't get everybody too confused. Um, some of the obstacles and, and things here, they're, they're not huge, they're just minor. Um, this one here is gonna take quite a bit. Now, once I get this mounted under the dash, I may not even use the damn thing. I may just abandon it, or I could wire it into some front side speakers and just have... Uh, some kick panel speakers or maybe mount some under the dash uh, type speakers and not even worry about this even after I go through all the trouble to get it mounted. All right, well, like I said, I hope I didn't get everybody confused. Pete North Las Vegas, over and out.